So we come from really good stock in unity. Do you know that? <laughs> you know, part of this unity family goes all the way back to the beginnings of New Thought and when unity was founded by our co-founders, Charles and Myrtle. And to give you just a little bit of a flavor of where we come from, Charles Fillmore said at the age of 94, I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm and spring forth with a mighty faith to do the things that ought to be done by me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 94, I wanna be 94 with that kind of zeal, don't you? But that is what we draw from. That is the continuity that comes from the Unity family that we are a part. And so today we are unpacking the power of zeal. We're in our 12 powers series and the power of zeal is found at the medulla, the brainstem, just behind the neck. So you can kind of see that sort of propelling forward kind of energy that zeal is. It's also signified by the color orange. And I see even some of our newcomers wore orange today, just very instinctively. <laughs> Orange is also the color that you find in the second chakra, which is the, the chakra that's all about desire. So you can see where desire is a propelling force behind our zeal, our passion. Zeal is that revitalization or vitalization, that, that generative kind of energy, the passion that we have, the get up and go when we really feel excited about something. That is the essence of zeal. And we can also find ourselves at times, or maybe right now in your life, you may feel a little ho-hum or lackluster or kind of like in a space of mediocrity. And, and so don't worry because zeal is near. <laughs> and that will actually, those feelings, whatever is naturally up for you will lead you to zeal. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along today. So t starting out to kind of get it stirring for you, just to begin to think about or to, to reflect upon for a moment, what do you love? You know, what do you really love about life? What really gets your, you going? What really feeds your soul and gets you excited about doing or thinking about? You know, what is it that you love? What are your passions? This begins to get you to start to open to that power of zeal and, and to fully bring it forth um, for your life. Pure zeal is just like pure energy. It's pure passion. We all have those moments in our walk of zeal when we are in just the complete and utter, just overtaken by zeal and by passion. My dog Hazel the Hairy Mystic was one of those. <laughs> she was a beagle and she was absolutely passionate about playing ball. I mean, when ball, when we were, when I was done, because <laughs> it was always, she always outplayed me by a long shot. Um, when it was done, I would have to hide the ball. And sometimes she would see, she would watch where I put it. <laughs> and she would literally sit, like I remember putting it in the hall closet once. And she literally sat outside the hall closet and looked like, like she could stare the door open or something. <laughs> and whined and low growled for like a good hour. You know, before <laughs> she finally gave up. She would do this thing when we would play in the yard. So I would throw the ball for her for a while in the yard when I got home from work. And then, you know, then I'd want to go on about my business. And sometimes I'd think, well, I'll just leave the ball out and she can kind of bat it around herself, right? Well, she was so clever, she wanted to keep me engaged that she would, you know those drain pipe extensions, those, those kind of plastic sleeves that go, she would stick the ball in there and then stand and bark until I came back out to get the ball out. <laughs> She was so good at training me, you know, that's, that's how it works, right? When we say we're going to dog training. No, it's about the people. So, so one day she did this and I think I got in, went inside and I was on the phone and I thought, well, she'll just keep barking, you know, whatever. But then it got very quiet, like eerily quiet. And so I went out and there's this dog body with like a three foot drain pipe for a head, you know? <laughs> all over, <laughs> there must have been like a little seal in there with a bell bouncing on top of her nose, you know. So, so at first it was really funny, and then, it, then her body started to kind of, you know, get quiet, and I thought, oh my goodness, I don't know if she can breathe in there. So I ran and got the scissors, you know, in this sort of frenetic, you know, oh, my baby, you know, try to get it cut open safely. And, and so as soon as I got it off of her nose, there was this, <gasps> you know, this breath, and then she caught sight of the ball. <laughs> 
And it was like half a breath back into life and she was right on the ball, you know? So, it, it, you know, it was like to live is to play ball for this dog, you know? To breathe is to play ball better than life, you know? So that's kind of the mode we can get in when we're in our full moments of zeal, you know, to have that kind of passion, that kind of complete presence with the moment and focus on what it is that brings us the joy. So, you know, it, it's not always something so obvious in there for us. Sometimes zeal gets discovered, even gets transformed or uncovered from a place where we go in kind of resistant. Henry Emerson Fosdick is a writer, and he talked about uh, growing up in upstate New York. And, and one particular day that really stood out for him, memory that stood out for him, was a day when his mother asked him to go pick a quart of raspberries. And so she gave him this bucket, and he didn't want to do it. And so he was, you know, dragging his feet and rebelling as much as he could get away with. So maybe there was like a little bit of stomping and dragging and head down kind of thing. But he knew he had to do it. So he went out and he was, you know, very, it was hot and he was very slowly picking the raspberries. And you know how this is, right? When we get in that mode of resistance, it's like everything is worse. It's super hot, like it must be 105. And, you know, like everything gets ramped up, right? And this is so boring and it's so awful and I'm not getting to do, and we get in the awfulizing loop. So he was in that. And then suddenly a divine idea arose. And this idea was, that he could surprise his mother and pick two quarts of raspberries. And all of a sudden, everything shifted. Suddenly it was fun, and it was exciting to think about the joy that he was gonna give and the surprise that he was gonna bring. And, and they started going in his bucket a lot faster. And before you knew it, he was home delivering his great surprise, this little boy giving of his gift of joy to his mother. And the whole household was amazed, he says. And the story is told on and on. You know how that is, those family stories. And he says every time the family story comes around again, he's reminded of the power of the mind to shift. The power that we have at any given moment to say, I'm not really having fun doing this. What would make it more fun? <laughs> to open to some surprising idea, some gift of giving, some way of joy, and that puts us into this power of zeal. So we can discover zeal, we can uncover zeal. It's always there and available for us if we're willing, you know? Zeal is really that, that which we experience when we uncover value or when we discover the value in something. When something suddenly becomes valuable to us, then there is a sense of passion about it, a sense of excitement about it, a sense of joy. On Friday, we were in the Redwoods on a, our nature immersion, and somebody was talking about how you know, as a child, she spent so much time in, in the woods and, and playing in nature. And, and now, as an adult, she was just starting to come back to that rhythm. And as she spoke of it, you know, there was just that radiating light. And then she started using words like joy and vitality and purpose. And she was emulating, you know, these things. And so there was that sense of I've rediscovered, I've uncovered, I've, I've unpacked again what I value, what I care about, what brings me that kind of activated passion and energy in my life. And so it's that that brings us back to the zeal that is there, the zeal that runs through us, essentially. And when we have those moments, when we have those times where we light upon it and we feel that sort of zealous, excited, passionate energy, you know, you come upon an idea, and sometimes when you're with a group and you're, you're feeding off the idea to, to, you know, with each other, and there's just that sense of, greater raised energy in the room. Don't you just want to shout when that happens? <laughs> now you got to dance. <laughs> uh, 
And so when we feel that way, let's just do it, right? <laughs> Why not? You know, that spontaneity, that childlike spontaneity is part of what zeal is. And Otis Day and the Nights really captured it in that song. You know, and, and a lot of times our songs, you know, they're, they're written as love songs. But if you think about it as, as the, the, the love of spirit, the devotion of spirit, that is always there for us, you know? That makes us want to shout. When we begin to connect with that presence and that power in those divine ideas come to us that are so fun. There is that sense of, oh, now I remember who I am. Now I remember what I'm about. Now I remember I'm not in this alone. And whatever it is that's going on in my life, it can be healed, it can be transformed, I can be put back again on that path that brings me joy and passion and playfulness and excitement. It's there for us all the time, easily reachable even in our times of discontent. Because you know, if you feel unsatisfied or you feel unhappy in any way, that actually is divine discontent. <laughs> and divine discontent is a reminder that there is another way. And so it's actually that kind of thing is not something to resist or to think, oh, you know, well, I'm not feeling zeal or I'm not feeling joy. And, and so that makes me feel even more dissatisfied and more discontent. But instead to move with what is authentically present. You know, so if what is authentically present is a sense of dissatisfaction or unhappiness, to move into it instead of away from it. And when we step into it and we embrace it, we begin to, we feel that fully. And usually, you know, most emotions last like 40 seconds, I think, is a high end. So, you know, the things that we resist, we spend a lifetime resisting, we could have moved through in 40 seconds, you know? You don't have to medicate it, you don't have to, you know, avoid it at all costs. You could just step in, feel it, and then step through into the vitality that is there underneath it. So those feelings are, are just holding back, just a, a thin veil holding back the energy, the vitality, the excitement, the joy of spirit that wants to be known through you, that wants to be experienced through you, that wants to be expressed through you. So don't think that discontent isn't a great pathway because it is. Enthusiasm is is another word for joy, and the Greek root of that is in theos, in God, or filled with God. And so to be enthused, to be in zeal, is just to be tapped in, turned on, and, and, and moving forward in that, that feeling of being infilled with the Spirit, and, and knowing that that is the truth of who we are. So out of uh, discontent or desire, comes our zeal. Really, it arises out of both. The desire is an obvious one. Discon discontent, divine discontent, not always so much for us. But as we recognize it and realize that it is a pathway, it opens all kinds of possibilities for us. Ruth is one of the biblical characters that represents zeal. And Ruth um, it represents zeal because it was actually really out of a, a, an unhappy, dissatisfactory situation that her devotion arose. If you remember the story, Zeal, or Zeal, sorry, <laughs> Naomi and Orpa and um, Ruth are all talking, and they're in a land of famine, so they have to move on. All of their husbands have made their transition, so this isn't a particularly happy time for any of them. They're in a difficult place. And Naomi, the mother-in-law of Orpa and Ruth, says to, Ruth, to the, her two daughter-in-laws, you need to just go home. You know, go back to your families, go back to your mothers. And they were from Moab and she was from Judah. And so she said, you know, you go on home. And so Orpa decided she would go ahead and follow that advice. But Ruth loved Naomi so much and was so connected and devoted that she, she said no, and, and as Naomi encouraged her, no, no, really, you need to, Ruth said, no, wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And until the day you die, I will be with you. And so there is this outpouring of devotion that is also zeal. If you think about the Sufi poets or the, the Christian mystics, you know, there is just this deep, deep love and devotion for spirit. 
And, and, and it's it, that kind of devotion that is a kind of zeal, the kind of zeal that is a really a lasting zeal because we continue to remember it's in theos, enthused, filled with God, in God, and that keeps us constantly in that loop and on that steadfast path of zeal. See, some of us think about zeal as that sort of motivational speaker kind of energy, right? You know, I feel good and then I leave, you know? <laughs> and so it fizzles quickly, right? Or that rah-rah kind of energy. So everybody gets all ramped up and then it's just gone. And that's, that's not really zeal because the power of zeal is, is this, this um, long-term kind of experience of, of constant energy that is available to us. It's not a, just a one-time quick spark but it's an igniting of a slow burning fire. When I was about six, my um, father said that, announced that, you know, we had, we had been on occasion, like our vacations were to go to Indiana from Chicago and visit our family, or maybe to go to a lake and go fishing and swimming, which was really fun, but it wasn't like a big vacation. You know, we didn't do that kind of stuff until the day my father announced that we were going from Detroit, Michigan, all the way to California, to Disneyland for our vacation. Oh my gosh, I was just to the moon and back, like day after day, lying awake in bed, so excited for the day that would come when we would go to this mystical, magical place called California that was all the way across the country, and there was an ocean there, and God knows what else was there, but it was super exciting, you know? <laughs> So this was like a constant thought for me about like which day was it going to be that we were going to go to California. And then one day, all of a sudden, boxes arrive in our house and we're packing and I find out we're moving to Chicago. And I was like, huh, well, what about California? And like nobody had an answer for me. It was just like, well, we're just moving to Chicago. So nobody said, oh, honey, we're not, you know, <laughs> there was none of that. So there was just like, oh, my gosh, you know, just like a million pounds of crushing disappointment, you know? <laughs> like, Chicago, what's, where is that even, you know? So, so we did, of course, make the move, but this, this like, little ember was, was sort of in there, you know? It's like they, you know, there's just a little spark. And a lot of us, when we start to look at our, and activate our power of zero, we're gonna find those little sparks, those old dreams, those things that are sort of a part of us and in us, and, it, and it's like, it's still burning. It's like a little ember that's still burning in there. So as soon as I graduated from college, I headed to California. <laughs> <laughs> And I lived here in different places for about nine months, and then I got homesick, and I went home and spent another 25 years in the Midwest. But there it was again, you know? It just always was there, that, that magical, mystical land of California that calls me. And so here I am again. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> Thank you, God. But it's, it's, it's that, that's in us. That zeal is in us. So sometimes it may be like that, like a little seed that was planted at some time and it's still there for us to uncover. Or maybe some new passion that gets opened up for you as you begin to look and to, to see what is, what is here for me, what's in my heart, what is asking to be expressed in the world. Vincent van Gogh, the painter, wrote a, a, a letter to his brother Theo, and he said, ill as I am, at that time, obviously, a time when he was feeling very sick, ill as I am, I can, cannot not <laughs> be it, my whole life and the power of my life and the power of my creativity. I cannot not create, in other words. He said, you know, I, his actual, actual words, I cannot do without something which is greater than I, which is my life, my power to create. And so when we get into a passion like that, it's like this is who we are. This is what we do. This is what we, we, are, we feel like we were born for. Some of us, it's real clear like that, and it's one thing. Many of us, there's multiple passions and different things that, that bring forth that kind of feeling that this is, this is who I am, and this is what, what it's all about for me. It's kind of like electricity. You know, it's, it's, we take the, the plug and we and we plug into the, the source, into the outlet, which is the source. And then that electrical current runs through us. You know? So we're like the conduit, and electricity is the zeal, is the spirit, is the power of the zeal. And that lamp is our creation. 
you know, or, or whatever it is we're powering. So that form is the creation. So for, for Vincent, it wasn't that the zeal was self-generated. It was like an allowing, right? And then whatever it is that we create shines our light through it. So for us, for all of us, it's true too. The zeal, maybe, maybe more so than any of the other powers, doesn't kind of have this sort of existence in and of itself, but it's like a running electrical, you know, it's a running energy. It's a, it's a moving energy. And so we plug into source and then the energy begins to move. And we become the conduit and the one who shapes the form or who decides what that form is that will shine our light out into the world. For Vincent, it was painting. For someone else, it'll be dance. For somebody else, it'll be music, violin. Uh, for, you know, for someone else, it'll be gardening or, or it'll be creating some kind of project. You know, think about a lot of activists in the world who have that sort of single-sided passion about a cause that they want to really affect change in in the world. So whatever that is that lights your fire, it's, it's wanting to be lit or we wouldn't be talking about it today. You know, that is what happens in a soul group like this. We talk about what it is that spirit wants us to know, <laughs> wants to remind us of, wants, to, wants us to tap into. And so that power of zeal is, is asking that you be the conduit for it so that something can be created or co-created through you as you. Howard Thurman maybe said it best, when we're seeking a purpose, when we're seeking a sense, he said, don't look around the world and ask what the world needs, but ask what makes you come alive and do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Isn't that true? Yeah. And so it's that aliveness that we're looking for. Not so much looking outside of ourselves. We can find a zillion things outside of ourselves that, that need something. But if, and if you wanna look outside, then notice how you feel inside as you're looking. <laughs> you know? And what makes you come alive, then ah, that's my spark. That's my direction. That's what wants to be activated in me. That's the zeal that wants to be known through me. Ah, pace, pace, that's what, that's another aspect of this. So we have a sense of purpose and we have a sense of pure zeal, but there's also a kind of pacing to this. And that's where the power of wisdom comes in. The power of wisdom helps us so that we don't get in that sort of fizzled out kind of energy that we talked about, but we're in it for the long haul, you know, so that there's that sense of constant supply of energy, constant energy available to us to pour out into whatever it is that we are creating in the world. And so there's a, a wisdom brings a, a sense of that pace to us. Most of us in this room have, have earned our wisdom. <laughs> and so that, that we know how that, how that works. What, we know how we work. We know what, what is kind of too much for us and, and where we um, need a sense of wholeness. So it's for example, you might say to yourself, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anybody ever say that? It's pretty literal when we say that. I mean, when we say I'm getting ahead of myself or I'm falling behind or I'm beside myself, we're really saying something <laughs> about a separation between our energy and our body, you know? So I'm getting ahead of myself is often a zeal kind of thing when we get overzealous and we get really excited about what it is we're creating and it's cast out in front of us and we wanna do that, and we wanna do that, and we wanna do that, and, and but our body's going, hold on, you know? <laughs> like pace. And so that's the power of wisdom that helps us kind of temper things so that we can keep drawing the energy and, and utilizing the energy and drawing the energy and feeling the zeal, but not fizzling it out. Because then when it fizzles out, then we just go, oh yeah, every time I get excited about something, I have that experience, it just sort of fizzles out and I leave it behind or I walk out of one of those rah-rah sessions and then I think, yeah, I'm gonna do it. And then I you know, sort of don't. Don't follow through, anybody relate to this? <laughs> so my hope is today is not one of those experiences, but that instead it's like that slow and steady, you know, you get it, the slow and steady wins the race sort of thing. So it's like, I've got the energy there. And it's, it's sometimes it'll feel really on fire and it'll make me wanna shout. And other times it'll just be like, yeah, this feels good, this feels right. I'm on that journey, I'm on that path. I'm on that road that really lights my fire. Because if you are following the fire in your belly, 
then you are giving to the world in a, in a way that the world needs because you are alive. And what the world needs is people who have come alive. That's us, right? Alive, alert, awake, enthusiastic. And even in our discontent, recognizing that where we are discontent, where we are dissatisfied, that that too is a pathway. I wanna really have us really honor that because it's a key part of the whole. So I wanna encourage you this week just to think about three things that you're passionate about. And maybe it's a long ago childhood dream that's been left behind or something that's really up for you or something you need to search your heart for. But what, is, what am I really excited, what brings me joy? What, what really lights my fire? And then look at it and see which of those are you engaged in? Are you engaged in any of them? And so what could you do to engage at least one of those? What could be a first step to begin to engage and activate that power of zeal? And as you do so, then you know you'll, you'll constantly be given the energy as you, as you plug into the source, as you go back to that place of prayer and meditation and quiet just to remind yourself and infill yourself. You'll be given the energy again and again to keep doing that which you love, that which lights your fire. So we are sizzling with zeal and enthusiasm to spring forth and do the things that ought be done by us. Let's say that together. I sizzle with zeal and spring forth to do what ought be done by me. And so it is. Thank you.